All right, now let's talk about Richard Hackloot's uh, Discourse on Western Planting, uh, which is the first primary document that we're going to read this week. And it's, it's a fascinating document because it is a wonderful example of what might be called promotional literature. Uh, it, some people might call it propaganda. Um, you know, Richard Hackloot is writing this to encourage people, especially Queen Elizabeth, of course, uh, to support the colonization efforts, England's colonization efforts in the New World. And so remember what we talked about in class, kind of the ABCs of, of analyzing a primary document. You always want to look at the A, the audience. Who's he writing to? Uh, and Richard Hackloot is, is writing specifically to her Majesty the Queen, of course. It says that, you know, at the very first, uh, at the very top on page 22, right, a brief collection of certain reasons to induce Her Majesty and the state to take in hand the Western voyage and the planting there, right? So he's writing specifically to Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and in fact, he's writing on behalf of a particular uh, a colonizer named Walter Raleigh, Sir Walter Raleigh. Uh, you may recognize that name from Raleigh, North Carolina, the capital of North Carolina, named in his honor. He was one of the early explorers who, who sought to create settlements in, in what is now North Carolina. He, was, he established an ill-fated one uh, down in, in North Carolina that, that, that disappeared, and so we don't remember uh, it the way we remember Jamestown. But Sir Walter Raleigh wanted to get Queen Elizabeth's financial support primarily. Uh, and the weight of the, the English nation behind his efforts, and the colonization efforts in general, because he thought that, that, the, that exploiting the New World, that settling the New World, would be, bring tremendous glory and profit to, to England. And so he asks uh, Richard Hacklund to, to help him come up with uh, uh, a series of arguments to, to make the best case possible for why England should support this, this colonization effort, which no one knew was, if it was going to be any good or not. No one knew if it was going to be profitable or not. They knew it was going to be tremendously risky and tremendously expensive. Uh, and Queen Elizabeth was, was supportive in principle, perhaps, but quite skeptical about the how much money she really wanted to put in. She had other she had other things to worry about back home, uh, particularly with Spain and the, the growing conflict with Spain. So, Sir Walter Raleigh and Richard Hacklute and other people interested in colonization are seeking to convince Queen Elizabeth and the state and, and leaders throughout the state. I mean, they're they're not so much interested in. Uh, in in convincing the public per se, because public opinion doesn't have the same sway in Elizabethan England as, as uh, it might in modern America. So they're really focusing on the leadership. How can we convince the leadership to, to support our efforts? And so in this, in this essay, he's, he's listing 23 reasons, and we're, we're just reading an excerpt uh, of a few of them to try to make the strongest case possible. Another, one other thing you have to know about Richard Hackloot, at this point he has not visited the colonies himself. He hasn't gone there himself. He did visit France and has studied um, and t studied the different colonization efforts in, Eng in England and France and, and talked to many people and, and is friends with many people, but he's not been there himself. He's also a Protestant reverend. You know, so he's coming out of the church. He's a writer uh, and a reverend. He has a very strong religious motivation behind what he's doing. And so he's driven to, to write this on behalf of his, his friends because he believes in, this, in what they're doing, but also because he believes in, in spreading Protestantism around the, around the world. Now, looking at, at this, this very short uh, excerpt that we, that we have here, he has various different arguments that he's going to, he's going to marshal in favor of colonization, right? He, he's basically trying to bring together all the different things that, that he thinks might be convincing, might be persuasive to Queen Elizabeth. Um, and so we talked about audience. He's writing for Queen Elizabeth. We also want to talk about his bias, right? He's a, he's a Protestant reverend. He has a certain take on uh, Spanish Catholics, right? That, that you, you read very clearly in here. 
Um, he he's English. He's living in in uh, the late 1500s when it's a it's a very exciting time um, because there is so much exploration going on and so many people from different countries are actively engaged in trying to figure out what the new world is, how big it is, what what exists there, what plants and animals are there, what people are there. Uh, so it's a very exciting time. You know, his particular slant is that that England has to take advantage of this opportunity right now, lest we be left behind, right? So, got the audience. You, you know a little bit about who he is as a Protestant reverend from England who wants to promote colonization. The context is in, in the late 1500s as, as England is competing with Spain, France, to a lesser extent, the, the Netherlands, in, in exploring this new world, trying to figure out what, what advantage they can take of this. Uh, so, those are the, the ABCs before we begin, get going. And now, now let's read, read this, right? So, you know, his first, his first point is the soil yields and may be made to yield all the several commodities of Europe. Right? So there's an economic reason, right? That, that here's all this beautiful soil. It, it's a temperate climate similar to, to a European climate. And so we can bring the, the, the crops that we already know how to grow, we can, we can grow in this new climate. This will be great for, for our agricultural industry. Uh, the passage thither and home is neither too long nor too short, but easy and to be made twice in the year. Of course... He's writing in the 1580s, okay? So uh, a, a sea voyage of several weeks is considered easy, not too long, not too short, right? I mean, for us, the idea of, of, of getting on a boat and sailing anywhere for, for three or four weeks or getting on anything, a ship, a rocket ship or anything for a month or, or six weeks would be insane. I mean, even an eight-hour car ride is considered too long for us. Uh, the passage cuts not near the trade of any prince, nor any of their countries or territories, and is a safe passage, and not easy to, to be annoyed by prince or potentate whatsoever. Right? He's thinking, of course, of European powers. That that the Atlantic Ocean, you know, nothing. There's, there's been very little of the New World that's been really claimed uh, at this point. I mean, this is what it, this is. This is the period when all the the European powers are are trying to claim various parts of the New World, and he's saying, as of right now. We, we weren't stepping on anybody's toes, right? Of course, he's not talking about the Native Americans. He's not talking about the Indians who already lived there and their powers and potentates, right? Because in his mind, from his European perspective, they really don't count, right? He's looking at it in the context of European political powers. And he's, he's arguing to Queen Elizabeth that this is this is an opportunity to, to gain without angering anyone else. Now, again, got to think about his bias, right? He's trying to make the strongest case possible. So he's going to, to dismiss or ignore any potential challenges, any potential complications, anything that might go awry, right? He's not talking, he's not going to talk about the conflicts that might arise when England goes to, to settle North America. Now, we skip a few to, to number six, right? It says, This enterprise, enterprise may stay the Spanish king from flowing over all the face of that waste firmament of, of America if we seat and plant there in time, right? And so this is where he's appealing to her, her nas nationalism, right? Her, her desire for national glory because he's saying, Look, if we don't do this in time, What's going to happen? The Spanish are going to come. They're going to take all this over. We know that they're interested. We know that they've been sending explorers over there too. If we don't act now, they're going to take over. Why is that a problem? Well, part of it is because Spain is, a, is another great power, the great rival uh, of the English. A few years after Hackwood writes, actually, that the Spanish will try to invade. Uh, the Spanish are modeled across the English Channel to invade England. Right, so th this is th this rivalry is is like the the old U.S. and Soviet Union during the Cold War. I mean, these are these are big powers fighting each other, and so they want to seek any advantage that they can get. And so Hakluyt is is telling the the Queen, if you don't do it, they will. 
they'll take over this whole continent. And we can't let that happen, right? So he goes on to say, And England, possessing the purposed place of planting, Her Majesty may, by the benefit of the seat, having won good and royal havens, have plenty of excellent trees for masts. He's talking about the shipbuilding industry, which is a, a major industry in England, uh, of course, for any, any Navy-based uh, great power, of goodly timber to build ships and to make great navies of pitch, tar, and hemp, and all things incident for a royal navy, and that for no price and without money or request. He's basically trying to claim, he's arguing here that, that this is free for the taking, right? This land is free for the taking. Whichever European power can get itself together and get out there and, and take control of it, it's basically free. All this land, all this timber, all the tar and pitch you could ever want, there it is for the taking. It's up to us to go out there and get it. Again, we got to remember his bias, right? His particular slant. He is interested in getting Queen Elizabeth's support for, for colonization efforts. So, of course, he's going to downplay any, any costs involved, right? So, how easy, continuing on, how easy a matter it may it be to this realm, swarming at this day with valiant youths, rusting and hurtful by lack of employment, and having good makers of cable and of all sorts of cordage, and the best and most cunning shipwrights of the world, to be lords of all those seas, and to spoil Philip's navy, and to deprive him of yearly passage of his treasure to Europe, and consequently to abate the pride of Spain and of the supporter of the great Antichrist of, of Rome. Right? And this is great stuff here, right? So here he's melding the economics and the, and the religious motivations, right? On the one hand, here in, in England, we have all these valiant youths, you know, strong young men who have no jobs, who are unemployed, right? You read about the enclosure movement that's going on in England where, where poor people are being pushed off the land and into cities, and, you know, the cities are just teeming with, with the unemployed, and, and what do we do with all these people? We, we can't find jobs for them here in England. But here's this new land. We can send them over, right? And, and they can be the ones who cut down the timber and, you know, and, and who build the ships for our wonderful Navy. And when we do that, we will check the power of Spain. The great Antichrist of, uh, of Rome, right? They, they who support the great Antichrist of Rome. Of course, that's the Pope. Right? Because because this, again, we, we think about Richard Hackloot. Where is he coming from? Well, he's a Protestant minister. In the, in the decades uh, after the Reformation in England, when Protestantism is, is, is a new and, and young and, and very aggressive young, uh, uh, religion and, and fighting very much the, the, the tremendous power of the Pope in Rome, and so he, he sees this as part of this, the, this global battle for, for religious dominance, right? We can't let Catholic Spain win over. We can't let Catholic Spain take control of America because then look at all the riches that will come to them instead of to, to us, the good Protestants here in England. Right, and then he he, can, he he goes on to say, you know, we'll pull him down, you know, the the king of Spain, pull him down in equality to his neighbor princes, and consequently to cut off the common mischiefs that come to all Europe by the peculiar abundance of his Indian treasure, and this, without difficulty, right? So he's saying, Spain, with all this treasure that they're they're getting from their from their overseas empire which makes them stronger. We can cut that down by, by, by colonizing America. And we can do this without difficulty, right? I mean, this is a class, without difficulty. What is he talking about? Right? It's going to be tremendously difficult. He knows that. He's not, right? He's a promoter. He's a, he's a seller, right? He's trying to sell this idea to, to the Queen of England and to, to the leaders of England. And so he's going to, he's going to act as if pretend as if there's going to be no cost and no difficulty involved. We know, of course, that that is simply not, not the case. But that's not his point here, right? He's trying to win them over. Okay, so moving over, we're going to look now at, at number seven. This voyage, albeit it may be accomplished by bark or smallest penance for advice and, or for a necessity, yet for the distance, for burden and gain in trade, the merchant will not for profit's sake use it, but by ships of great burden. 
So as this realm shall have by that means ships of great burden and of great strength for the defense of this realm. Right? So he's saying that, look at how how difficult it is. You know, before he said, you know, this voyage is not very difficult. And he said, you know, yeah, you can go over in a small boat, maybe. But what the, the people who are really going to take control here of the, of the trade are going to be the big merchants who are going to build big, big ships, right? Ships of great burden, ship, ships that can carry a lot of goods to and from uh, England and, and North America, right? And so by the building of these big ships, that's going to that's gonna enrich England, right? That's going to bring great strength for the defense of this realm. It's going to help protect us by having these big ships, these big, big merchants who are on our side, right? Now, number 10, no foreign commodity that comes into England comes without payment of custom. Right? That's like a tax, I mean, it's customs. Once, twice, or thrice before it comes into the realm. And so all foreign commodities become dear, become more expensive, to the subjects of this realm, right? So he's saying English people have to pay a lot for foreign commodities because they're, they, they're taxed so, so much at every step of the, the process, both on the front end and, and when they come to England. And by this course, foreign princes' princes's customs are avoided, and the foreign com commodities cheaply purchased. They become cheap to the subjects of England, to the common benefit of the people, and to the great sa treasure, saving of a great treasure in the realm. Whereas now the realm becomes poor by the purchasing of foreign commodities in so great a mass at so excessive prices. Right? So he's saying, look, right now we, we buy the goods that are coming in from America and other foreign areas. And when we do, we have to pay tremendously high prices. Why? Because there are all these duties and import taxes and so forth. And so we're becoming poorer by buying foreign goods. But if we colonize, if we engage in this enterprise by this course, right, if we do this, what I'm saying we should do, we will get those, those foreign goods become our goods. They're coming from abroad, but they're part, they're subject to England. So we'll be able to bring them in without all those extra taxes that go to enrich our, our rivals. Instead, they'll come and enrich us. And they will, will our subjects, our, the English people, will be able to enjoy these things at much lower prices. At number 11, at the first traffic with the people of those parts, the subjects of this realm becomes the, for many years shall change many cheap commodities of these parts for things of high value they are not esteemed, and this to the great enriching of the realm, if common use fail not. Right? He's talking about trade. You know, we can trade things that may not be of value to us, but might be of value to, to Indians, and in return get things of great value to us. Right? I mean, he sees a very exploitative kind of relationship in some ways here. Right? He, he knows that, that, that certain things are not valued in Indian culture the way they're valued in European culture. And so they're able to trade what English people might consider trinkets, pots and pans, or alcohol, different, different things that the Indians will value in return for the, the things that, that England wants, particularly gold and other kind of, of precious gems, uh, uh, deer skins, which are valued in, in, in Indian culture, but highly, highly valued in, in England, you know, deer skins, beaver skins, and so forth. So he's talking about trade and the, the advantage that England will gain from this tremendous trade possibilities that exist. Number 13, by making of ships and by preparing of things for the same, by making of cables and cordage, by planting of vines and olive trees, by making of wine and oil, like all these different things that are, that are part of settling this country, by husbandry and by thousands of things there to be done, infinite numbers of the English nation may be set on work to the unburdening of the realm with many that now live chargeable to the state at home. Again, he's going back to this unemployment problem. I mean, you know, I, we see, we hear echoes of this, in, you know, in any venture that that we want to do today, right? We, it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. You listen to any presidential candidate, right, and they're going to talk about jobs, jobs, jobs. That's what Hackloot's talking about because he knows that it matters to Queen Elizabeth, not because her subjects will throw her out of office necessarily, but she wants to avoid social unrest at home. Right? She knows, and the leaders of Parliament know, that, that having masses of unemployed young men in, uh, fighting in their cities you know, and going hungry in their cities is not a recipe for, for social harmony. 
right? And so she wants harmony in her realm. If she wants her realm to, if she wants England to grow and to prosper, she's got to figure out this unemployment problem. She's got to figure out what to do with these young men. And Richard Hackwood is saying, look, I've got a solution. Send them to America. Because in America, they will have thousands of things to do. There's going to be so much work to be done in settling, in settling this country, clearing the land, getting this country ready for settlement. 16. We shall by planting there enlarge the glory of the gospel and from England plant sincere religion and provide a safe and sure place to receive people from all parts of the world that are forced to flee for the truth of God's word. Right? And here's where the religious motivations come in. Right? Again, he's a reverend. He's a Protestant reverend. He believes in that, that Protestantism must vanquish Catholicism. Right? So he wants England to plant sincere religion. Of course, that means Spain is planting insincere religion, right? Planting Catholicism in this in this country, and so we need to, to spread, enlarge the glory of the of the gospel, and and allow people who are fleeing, uh, you know, who are persecuted because they believe in in uh, Protestantism, allow them a place to go, right? So so the religious motivations are go along with these economic motivations that he's been talking about from the beginning. And now he's going to go and explain why the Spaniards in particular are so bad, right? And, and what's interesting is he read the same thing that you read in class, the Bartolome, the Bartolome de las Casas' uh, report on Spanish atrocities in the New World. He's read that, and so he's using information from that to, to make the argument that England must now go forth and, and colonize. The Spaniards govern in the Indies with all pride and tyranny, and like as when people of contrary nature at sea enter into galleys, where men are tied as slaves, all yell and cry with one voice, Liberta, Liberta, as desirous of liberty and freedom. So no doubt whatsoever the Queen of England, a prince of such clemency, shall seat upon that firmament of America, and shall be reported through all that tract to use the natural people there with all humanity, courtesy, and freedom. They will yield themselves to her government and revolt clean from the Spaniard. Right? He's read De Las Casas. He knows that the Indians are mistreated there. And he says, you, the Queen of England, you are so merciful. You won't treat them like that. Right? You'll treat the natural people, the natural people, the Indians. They're with all humanity, courtesy, and freedom. Right? You'll treat them so much better. Once they see that, they'll revolt against the Spaniards. They'll leave the Spaniards. They'll come to our side. But we have to be there. We have to show them the mercy uh, of the Protestant religion. Of course... He's not talking about what might happen if the Indians do indeed come to the, the English side or what happens to Indians who are, who are nearby to English settlements, right? He, hasn't, he, he doesn't talk about how the English themselves might treat the Indians. And we're going to learn la later, we read uh, in, the, in the chapter, that, that there's a lot of conflict that happens between the in Indians and the English. But Hackwood's not talking about any of that. Of course, he wants to make the strongest case. He's, he's saying the Spaniards are horrible, uh, horrible conquerors. They mistreat the Indians. We Protestant English uh, folks won't treat them that way. You, Queen Elizabeth, of course, would never treat them that way. Now, 21. Many soldiers and servitors in the end of the wars that might be hurtful to this realm may there be unladen to the common profit and quiet to this realm, to England and to our foreign benefit there, as they may be employed, right? They're fighting all these wars. What happens when all the soldiers come home, right? I mean, we see this in, in, in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, or World, World War II or Vietnam. What happens when these soldiers come home from war, right, and have no work, and, 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 and are, are troubled by their experience in war, right? What happens to them? Well, we don't want them here in England, right? Because they could cause trouble. So let's send them abroad, right? We can be, we, may there be unladen. We can, we can send them abroad and leave them there. And there they'll find work. They'll find something to do. Again, the, the fear of, of having masses of unemployed men uh, milling about in the city is, is, helps to drive English colonization. And finally, 22, the wandering beggars of England that grow up idly and hurtful and burdenous to this realm, may there be unladen, better bred up, and may, may people waste countries to the home and foreign benefit, and to their own happy state. Right? 
So it's not just these soldiers coming home, but it's also the wandering beggars and their children, people who have no work, who are doing nothing, who are, who are only hurting our country. Right? What do we do with them? Well, we can get rid of them. We can send them across the ocean. Have them, have them settle North America. Have them deal with the Indians. Have them clear the land and, and plant. Right? And cut down the trees for, for our ships. That's the way that we can both preserve social harmony at home and make the colonies economically useful and beneficial to us. Right? So, so again, all the, these ideas, and, he, and he's got basically three sets of themes going on here. One is the economic thing, right? This is going to benefit us economically. It's going to provide uh, land for, for agriculture. It's going to provide raw materials for our industries. It's going to provide an outlet for our unemployed. Right? It's going to benefit us. We're going to prosper. England is going to prosper from, the coloni from colonization. He's got national reasons, right? political reasons. Right? If we don't go there, Spain will. And if Spain goes there and gets rich, they're going to be much stronger and more powerful than we are. If we want to enhance our power, if we want to grow stronger as a nation, if we want to counter our rival Spain, we need to be there. We need to be in North America. This is where it's at. This is, this is the, 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 the new frontier. Right? I mean, the, the, this is where we need to be in order to prosper. And he's got religious reasons. So you've got economic reasons, political reasons, religious reasons. He's saying, look, Catholic Spain is horrible. They're over there mistreating the Indians. They're over there spreading their, their insincere religion. We need to go. We need to bring our sincere religion. We need to, to treat the native people with, with justice and humanity and show them that, that the Spaniards are, are cruel and horrible. Um, and we need to be there to spread the enlightened word of, of God. All of these come together in his mind to make a very powerful argument in, in favor of colonization. And so Hackloot is probably the, the most famous of these boosters, but there are lots of people uh, at this time and in the, in the 17th century who are writing these kinds of documents, these, these pamphlets, these, uh, they're, they're basically boosters. They're, they're trying to get people to emigrate. They're trying to get leaders to support the, the initiatives. They're trying to get investors to, to, to invest in their, in their uh, enterprises, their, their foreign enterprises. And so they're, they're making the strongest case they possibly can. And of course, in the process, they have to dismiss or ignore some of the challenges that are going to come up, both financial uh, as well as cultural and, and political. You know, they're going to clash politically, not only with other imperial powers and, and European powers on the North American continent, but also with the Indians who are already there. Right? And, and it's something that, that Hackloot, you know, hopes or, or argues that, that England is going to treat these, these people so much better than the Spanish did. But as we see in the chapter that we read, from the very beginning, uh, conflicts erupt as, as more and more English, English settlers pour in and, and want more and more of the, Spanish, Spanish, of the Indians' land. So that's the, the first reading for, for this week. Hope you enjoyed it, and we'll see you next time.